how does this work? How does this work? Obeying God rather than men, as, as the phrase goes. This doesn't mean a kind of cheerful, holy anarchy. We have in our generation to relearn the grammar of a New Testament political theology. It's all here. We have screened it out because ever since the deism of the Enlightenment, we have been taught that there is no such thing as a New Testament political theology. All there is is Romans 13, which tell you to obey the authorities, and one or two other cognate passages. It's absolute rubbish. We have been fooled. We have been conned by this. And the trouble is that after the Enlightenment ruled out a biblical political theology as impossible, what it gave us instead was a political theory of left and right, of anarchy over here and tyranny over there, and we in the West don't much like tyranny, and we're not quite sure about anarchy. We, most of us haven't really experienced that much anarchy because some sort of civil order has tended to be characteristic of the societies in which we've lived. And we've assumed that democracy is the thing which we hold on to in the middle, which prevents anarchy on the one hand and tyranny on the other. In the New Testament, it is actually the lordship of Jesus Christ which prevents both anarchy and tyranny. There's an entire course of lectures on political theology, biblical political theology waiting to be given under the heading of the last few sentences that I've just said. And uh, you can ask me about that later if you like. I find this quite worrying because actually uh, I do not want to live in a society other than a thoroughly democratic one, although there are different types of democracy. You know, the way you do it here is quite different from the way we do it and different again from how France does it, etc., etc. Uh, but it really does appear that the way the last 200 years in the Western world have, has construed liberal democracy is doing the same job within political thought as the kingdom of God does in the Gospels. I think one of the tasks of our day is to rethink what it means to be servants of Jesus while being Western Democrats and how those two play out and how they relate to how we see the rest of the world. That's what's actually going on here. They're having to navigate in a whole new way what it means to be loyal to Jesus and hence when the Sadducees or Herod or ultimately Caesar tell them to do something else say actually no we're going to obey God and not you and then of course this results in the internal challenge for the church chapter 5 Ananias and Sapphira the challenge to holiness to actual integrity not least to financial integrity Somebody said we had a debate in our General Synod last week um, about the current financial crisis. And it was interesting. There was an awful lot of Bible being thrown around in that debate. And, and eventually somebody said, isn't it interesting? We've had far more reference to the Bible in the, in the debate on money than we ever had in a debate on sex. And somebody else said, well, it's perhaps because the Bible is actually more interested in money than it is in sex, which might just be true. And again, we in the Western world have tended not to look at it like that. But again, the clash with the authorities. And this time, this character Gamaliel emerges, who says, um, this is chapter 5, verse 34, who says, listen, you don't know. It might be that God is in this new movement. If he isn't, it'll fall by its own weight. If he is, you better watch out, because you might be found to be fighting against God. And this is a pattern which emerges all through Acts, that when the church trusts God and speaks up, it will find friends in surprising places. See, what already we're getting in the book of Acts here is the beginning of a much larger theme which works its way out into the second century. That to and fro between the apologia which the church offers to the wider society. This is who we are. We are not actually community wreckers. We are community builders. We are not a danger to your society. We are simply following the Lord who is in fact transforming and healing the whole world with, on the other hand, martyrdom. But nevertheless, if you tell us to do something which goes against what Jesus is telling us to do, we're going to stick with Jesus rather than with you. So some of the greatest apologists also become some of the greatest martyrs, like Justin Martyr, Polycarp, etc., in the second century. See the roots of that here, the kingdoms of the world and the kingdom of God. 
and it finishes again, <coughs> chapter 6, the, um, uh, the Hebrews and the Hellenists having this problem because their widows are being neglected in the, in the distri distribution of daily food. This is a problem which only occurs because the early church is living as a family. If they weren't living as a family, this problem wouldn't have existed. They are caring for one another. Widows, in days before there's any social security systems, widows are cared for by the family, but if you become Christians, the church is your family. How are you going to cope with that? Already ethnic divisions are starting to surface, so the church looks to the Spirit to provide ministries, ministries that serve the unity of the church. Get hold of that. Ministries that serve the unity of the church. And interestingly, after this whole first section, the church is the alternative temple. What happens? Chapter 6, verse 7, the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's very significant. <coughs> they are seeing the writing on the wall. This really is the new temple. We've been serving the old one. God has done the new thing. It's time to make the move. And so the centerpiece of this whole great first half of Acts, chapter 6, verse 8 to chapter 8, verse 3, Stephen and the judgment on the old temple. And of course, Stephen's speech is one of those glorious moments in Second Temple Judaism when you get a fresh retelling of the story. There are many passages in Jewish literature of the time where people go right back to the beginning, to Abraham or even before Abraham. Stephen starts with Abraham, but some will take it from the creation. And they tell the story highlighting certain things in order to make certain points about where we now are in the story. And the whole point of Stephen's telling of this story is that we, the followers of Jesus, are the true heirs of this entire story. And within the story, we observe two things in particular. One, that God frequently sends uh, messengers or, or re redeemers to his people and the people reject them. And two, that the people always tend towards idolatry and the building of the temple is always in danger of being exactly that. Those are the themes which emerge from the speech of Stephen. God's act of liberation through rejected rulers, Joseph and Moses, and then the idolatry of the people. And again, the quote from Amos in verses 42 and 3, it'd be worth looking at the context for that, but then particularly in verses 49 and 50, the quote from the beginning of Isaiah 66. As I said before, Isaiah 66 addressing, so people tend to think, the, the uh, Jews of the Second Temple period after the exile, saying, listen, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, don't think now that you're going to build me a house. I know you had one before, but please get used to the fact that even Solomon's temple, one of the most wonderful constructions ever built in the ancient world, was only an advance signpost. And you know, if when you're on a long journey, if you see a signpost which is pointing to your destination, if you've been wandering for a long time, you'll be so pleased that there's a signpost, the temptation is simply to say, phew, now we know where we are, let's sit down and be here. But of course that's not what the signpost is for. You immediately falsify the meaning of the signpost. The signpost says, no, don't stop here, do what I'm telling you, go on. And the temple in Jerusalem was the signpost to the fact that the God for whom heaven and earth are his throne and his footstool is going to come and join heaven and earth in a new way. And that has now happened. The narrative is claiming that in Jesus and in the church we find the true heirs and fulfillments of the promises to Israel, not in the present temple. And what happens when Stephen is being stoned as though to say, I told you so. He sees heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Verse 56, Stephen, Luke is saying, witnesses the reality of that coming together of heaven and earth. The persecuted church, somebody asked about suffering last night, the persecuted church knows the reality of the heaven and earth joining in Jesus and the Danielic overtones of that.